we are live from Japan. From Japan, boys and girls. Welcome to this week's episode of Hollow Weekly. Nick and George here with, uh, what are we calling this one? Episodes, we are uh, episode worth fighting for. <laughs> Get some Mulan in there. <laughs> I yes. guess is what we would call it. Yeah. Episodes that. This is our rescue episode. We're yeah. Gonna, we're going to rescue some uh, some horror movie, horror show, horror adjacent properties that didn't get enough love or have something in them worth saving yes so something either there's a gem in there that we think is not talked about enough uh that needs a little bit more needs a little energy boost well here's the thing this is the 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 one of the reasons this this episode kind of uh popped into my head was i saw a, a really i saw a really funny tweet from brian collins the the horror uh, movie a day guy yeah he was like, it's it's October second where he is. We're in Kobe, Japan, so we're ahead. So yeah, it was so. I didn't know it's October first where he is. And then he goes, "Wow, only twenty four hours of seeing way more of my kind of stuff, and I'm already exhausted." <laughs> <laughs> so we're like in horror full swing. It's October, right? Yep. But what's going to happen is everyone's making their horror movie marathons, and you, ever all the legacy stuff is going to get big shout outs, right? We're all going to be watching Halloween. We're all going to be watching the slashers. We're all yep. going to be watching Universal Horror. But but anyway, I, and I love it. I'm gonna do all that. But before I get to it, I want to just pump the brakes and spend three or four days watching like some niche stuff. Yes, yeah, stuff to like warm up into the mood. That's still great, right? Mm-hmm. But you don't want to just go. What was that they did in the SNL skit? I started at eleven. I'm gonna take it to fifteen really fast. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't want to start at fifteen, right? I'm gonna no. Crank you want it up. you want to yeah. go. You want to go to a you know a good concert and get have a good opening this act. is the that's perfect this, this is, is the opening this act. is the opening act exactly right i was trying to think did anyone open up for frankie valley when i saw him and he was so good he didn't have an opening act it was just i'm frankie valley i'm gonna sing real high and then he just <laughs> fucking bounced lips he lip synced for a little bit and then, then got out of there classic so this is my this is my uh, this is the opening yeah, act. yeah this is the opening act okay so i I'll kick it. I'll kick this off. And basically, what we're gonna do is we're gonna we're gonna fight for that to get yourself in the mood for October and Halloween and the horror season, which really for us started in ever <laughs> all the time. It but hasn't really ended. It, it never just, really it ended, just but, kicked up a little more. Right, but now that it's now that it's at fifteen, we're we're gonna fight for two movies and a TV episode each. Yes. Okay. So I think I'll save the TV episode for last, cause, Me like, because we were just we just were talking about it. I was yeah. like, like I get all choked up just thinking about that episode. Yeah. <clears throat> that's we're... such a good, <laughs> such a good, that's such a good episode. Okay, so the first one that I want to fight for, yeah, and this one really, this this film has. To, You're really gonna fight for this one, I know. This it... this film has no choice but to fight. Oh no, it's not the it's not the Kevin oh, Smith one. Okay. I'm gonna okay, that, okay. that one. I'm, I'm <laughs> this well, I think even this is my opening act because <laughs> I'm gonna get real passionate. You got about. an opening band for your opening band. Yeah, I got an opening band for the opening band. Um, this film has to punch up, be considering its older brothers, and that one is Diary of the Dead. News agencies are reporting accounts of the dead returning to life. What's that? What was that? You can't talk about it. What is this about, Jason? Yes. So we actually just had someone uh, hit us up on Twitter asking, like, what's a film like we would. Actually, that was that was one. Of it the, was actually the amazingly talented uh, Alexander West from the Fat Lady Horror Podcast. She had posed the question. Um, she was talking about how she wanted to fight for As Above, So Below. Yes. And then you had commented, I would, and she was like, "What other found footage would you would you fight for?" And you you fought for Diary of the Dead. Yeah, <laughs> and this film is you know every 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 horror podcast is you know this film is underrated, and I don't I don't know if this film. Is you're about to say parts of this film are underrated? <laughs> I think yeah, I think parts of this film is underrated because as a whole, is this film phenomenal? Not really, right? It, I, I think the biggest like, just to get this out here, the biggest flaws with Diary of the Dead are most of the characters and a lot of the dialogue. Okay, because I even the scene I had sent you uh, in the hospital, which is one of my favorite scenes. Yes, they 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 destroy a zombie with defibrillators and its eyes. Blow that out. was amazing. I was cracking up. It's got mm. some great special effects. Like I remember watching behind the scenes and they had Greg Nicotero talking about it, and I was like, that Greg Nicotero guy is great, and now he's doing Walking Dead. <laughs> right, <laughs> so, right, right. That makes sense. Yes, it does. Um, <laughs> but there's a, there's like some dialogue in there where. It's it they it, it tries to be a little witty, but I think it falls a little short. It's like oh, dead doctor, dead nurse. That makes sense, and right. I'm like okay, that's a little. Bit. That's the weakest part of the film. Sure, but what I will say is that this is the most interesting shot Romero film. 
I think I think yeah, I big think statement. I yeah, which is very big. And I and I and I thought that through in my head. Like there's shots like the like the um the dream sequence in uh, Day of the Dead when the arms go through the wall. Yep. Um uh the one where the uh, D- Dawn of the Dead where the head gets chopped off by the helicopter. Like that's a cool shot. Everything from Night of the Living Dead mostly. Right. Uh, but I think a lot of that's attributed to the fact that it's shot in black and white, and I'm always gonna, I'm always gonna think that looks pretty. Well, good. and it's just amazingly shot. But I, yeah, I, the thing is that I don't know that you could compare. I feel like Knight's almost separate from everything else. Yes, in his work, right? I would, I would agree. But I think there's something about being on the ground and the with the zombies because that's what we always think about when we watch the Romero films. Is the one reason we like them is they're all very situational. Yes. you're in a mall, you're in a house. You're on an army base. You're going to survival. You're on an island. <laughs> we're, not going, we're not going that far. We're not going that far. Right. But there's something about when you, when you watch those films, you try to put yourselves in the shoes of those characters. Of like, what would you do? What would you do? Totally. And finally, in this film, we're there. And you have to do that in a found footage movie. Yes, you have no choice but to be there. You're in everyone's shoes in a found. Yeah, footage. and 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 I think I think honestly, it makes the zombies a little bit more intense because when you're watching them shot through. Uh, Dawn of the Dead you know it's beautiful so, you know it's nice cinematography but like when you actually are eye level with these creatures right and you actually have them coming towards the camera you you get a little this, this this sense of adrenaline of like oh I now understand why they're as frightening as they are even if they're slow and, and all sure, other shit sure you know it's 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 a it's a little frightening and you know George Romero like he he thought through everything he did yeah but he was the lightest on his feet overthinker that's ever been in cinema. Yeah. Right? Like, he overthought it, but he never really let it show that he overthought it, right? Mm-hmm. You, when you saw him in the interview, you are like, wow, he put all that thought into it, but it doesn't really weigh the movie down at all, like, with metaphors like some, like, A24 or shit would do, right? So, yeah, yeah, so, But he must have thought through what he was going to bring to found footage. Oh, yeah. Right? And I find that fascinating, that someone that skilled... Sat down and was like, "All right, here's a new genre. What am I bringing to this? You know what I mean? Which is which is cool." And the time it came out too, like we were talking before the episode, it came at the crossroads. It's of, between Blair Witch and Paranormal. Yeah, between it's between those two films. But even in terms of like where we were as a society, like YouTube hadn't become YouTube quite yet. Mm-hmm. You know, it was just getting started. But like it's, this film, sort of like a ticking time bomb. Like he sort of knew what it was going. What year was Diary to be? I think it was two thousand. Eight, I okay. believe, two thousand eight, two thousand seven. Um, but he he nailed what like vlogging and YouTube and all this other stuff would be with people wanting to post everything online because the film ends with rednecks. They have a zombie tied by her hair from a tree, and right. they blast her with a shotgun. And it's like it ends with like her eyes just like kind of like looking around, and it's a cool shot. Sure, but it just goes to show that, uh, of how everyone wants to post all these crazy shit online which he, he fucking nailed before it even solidified that that's what we were heading to right which i think is just the the mark of a genius <laughs> totally totally um but the great thing about this film is there's a lot of wait before you go on from the uh the video part i just want to because i'm i'm looking up what the what videos you were dealing with in the in 2007 on youtube just to place this in time right? oh jesus <laughs> right so the top video our meme timeline and it was it, i it's it we have slow internet in kobe japan so it's not loading completely but there's a girl a beauty pageant girl with a sash and i feel like i know what that represents but i'm not sure what it represents so i'll jump in with it when it comes up but go ahead i'm trying to think of what was 2007 like youtube I remember we discovered, like, Paul Gilbert, the guitarist from, like, Racer X and Technical Difficulties. <laughs> but, like, he was doing this outline. Like, I remember we discovered a lot of that stuff. Might have been, like, the cat and piano? Just the, yeah, just thing. the context, what, what it was. But, I mean, it was a weird era, right? Yeah. It felt like a weird in-between era. And okay. He, but he was able to, like, take all that weirdness and sort of figure out how to mold it into mm-hmm. something that I think was effective. Right. But the, the strong point with Diary is, even if you can't watch it as all well as a film, whether you think it's bad or not interesting it has several amazing moments in it sure and i think the scene when they're in the rv and the burnt zombie comes up to the window is fantastic i think the whole entirety of the hospital scene is great Mm -hmm. them ending in the mansion uh is also is also if we have a mummy zombie in this film which is really great (laughs) because they're making the other film or, or, or whatever right um i don't think it's a perfect it's not my it's i will fight for it it's actually i think i might have watched this a little bit more than Dawn of the Dead? 
Right, but we, we let's let's move it to a different spot because we had talked about this before, and I found it interesting. But before I do that, you were talking about the setups for this. Did you did you talk about that already? I can't remember the setup for the setups in this. I can't remember if you were no it, no, no, no. Matter. Okay, so let's put it in the found footage genre. Oh yeah. So where do you so the oh yeah we talked about that right. last night. So yeah, we're yeah. ranking this like the the best found footage films are stuff like Blair Witch and Paranormal Activity and and I, I would like put, Cloverfield. I would put Cloverfield. Cloverfield I put Troll Hunter. So these are like the best found footage ones, and then the bottom of the barrel found footage ones. I don't know. Gallows. Gallows. <laughs> Sorry, dudes. We almost just so they Sorry, know to th- console you, you made one hundred ninety-one million dollars or whatever. Yeah, but just so they know, mm-hmm. aside from the fact that they made out like bandits, we right. were going to do an episode, which we I, we still will, but episodes that have a great idea that could be fantastic, right? And the gals is one of them. Yes. So it's not, eh, but screw the pooch. Yeah, right. screw the pooch. So the yeah. gals be in the bottom, paranormal. Yes. Uh, Blair right. Witch so where top. do you put Diary? If I had to do it on a grade scale, like yeah. those two being yeah, A, yeah. the gals being F, I think this is a solid like B. B minus film. That's strong. Okay. Yeah. Like, Especially for a first effort in it. I know. I know that the paranormal Blair. So found footage is a weird genre because, like, with with a lot of genres, the first effort of someone. Although I guess horror maybe is a little bit of an exception to that, but but a lot of the genres, the first or second efforts, the directors hone their craft and then they pull off a masterpiece. Yeah. Like John Carpenter's, like his first film is not his best film, right? Mm-hmm. So, so it's, it, when you look at it, like, uh, George Romero's first found footage film, film to land it with a B plus. That's pretty good. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, the other thing is, is if you think about the found footage films in general, mm-hmm. if you look at the top ones, aside from Cloverfield's probably the anomaly in those, but Blair Witch is, uh, film students lost in the woods. Right. Paranormal activity is, the setups of them are actually pretty simple. Like it's just a camera in this living room. Someone stands there. Time goes for. But this is an actual zombie film. Right. Going more and sort of along the lines of Troll Hunter. I would say it's more in the Troll Hunter, Cloverfield mm-hmm. category. And trying to knock that out with the found footage template, I think it's a lot more difficult. Totally. It's a lot more difficult than doing your your traditional totally. narrative shot cinema type type deal. So totally. it's a big risk. And Romero so. could still bring the heat. I mean I think about like the crappy, the fucking terrible remake of Day of the Dead. Mm-hmm. And when you compare what he's doing to stuff like that, even when they have more budget than he did and more access to things, yeah. He still is beating them at their own game. Which, yeah, which is cool. There's just a, there's just a lot, and, and, the, and the film's narrated by I think the lead actress whose name escapes me, and it's a little dramatic, you know, like societies like, like that sure. kind of thing, sure. which is fine. Like it fits totally with like what he was going for. It's a little, it's not a little. I would say it's just a little. I don't want to even no. I don't want to say it's overcooked. But it's just it didn't hit me the right way. Right. Re, upon rewatching it, sure. But I think taking all that stuff out. And just looking at the fact that he was able to nail something before that something even was something, right. <laughs> if that sentence makes sense, totally uh, is, is remarkable. And 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 that he was able to do something different with found footage that was interesting in certain parts. And it's got great moments. So you're throwing a lifeline over to certain some of the scenes of Diary of the Dead. I, I would say I would say seventy percent of Diary of the right. Dead. The other the other thirty percent being dialogue i'm convinced <laughs> if, if they were if i could save shots and effects <laughs> right <laughs> uh, that would make it in the boat and they're like wait we need our dialogue i'm like it's too late <laughs> boastful <laughs> it's way too late you're boastful so that's the diary of the dead and also considering his other films like he this film is the little brother getting all the hand-me-downs and that's he, true <laughs> he's sitting at the little kid's table when he's 18 years old at thanksgiving he's like guys right. come on <laughs> give me give me a break here like i can sit with you guys now all right, so Diary of the Dead is in the October slot, warming up for the thing. I'll I'll mine. I'll go chronologically. I'll pick my oldest one first. Okay. So I'm gonna I'm gonna throw a lifeline to Island of Lost Souls. Mm-hmm. It's quite evident, isn't it, that I mean you no harm. This is the hand that makes. You know what it means to feel like God. Uh, 1932, I think it's a pre pre Hays Code classic. So that means wow. that it was 
before they could restrict it from all... I remember hearing John Landis talk about this and just being like, this movie, to this day, still has disturbing sadism, torture, perversion. Like, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a really, really tight film, even now. But the reason I'm saving this film is because that whole Paramount Universal 30s right up until mid-40s when horror was ruling the thing... That's my go-to to get really in the Halloween mood. Mm. I love to I love to break out Dracula and Frankenstein. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, that atmosphere is what makes me think of Halloween because it was the first things that I was watching as a kid to associate in the season, right? Yeah. And everyone does that. Everyone will not everyone, but most people will pull out like a Dracula or Frankenstein or whatever, even Invisible Man, even Wolfman, all those things to get in the mood for Halloween. No one goes to Island of Lost Souls, but it's oh. it's equal with those, uh, nearly equal with those with those movies, and and one of the reasons I want to fight for it is because what I'm looking for to get in the gear for Halloween is atmosphere, and this yeah. movie, so like this movie, is the the cross between Dracula and Frankenstein that people don't know exists. Wow, it's got the mad scientist action. Mm-hmm. In it, like, like the, it's got. The, there's literally a moment where Charles Lawton, who is an amazing uh, actor and villain in this, he was he directed Night of the Hunter, his only movie ever directed. Oh, by the way, enough said. Imagine that's your only movie, right? And he was Hunchback of Notre Dame in the original Hunchback, right? So I mean, this is an amazing actor. So so he's playing the villain in this movie, and and he's playing Doctor Moreau, and he, this guy. Like it, to me, this is there's this amazing thing that's happening here. Where in Frankenstein, the the it's alive is the moment, right? Mm-hmm. Like yeah, one, yeah. one of the in this one, he's literally in the shadows, and he turns to the the one of the protagonists in the movie, and he's like, "Do you know what it feels like to be God?" Oh. And it's so chilling, right? It's Damn. amazing. That's a good line. So he's an amazing villain. He's got the mad scientist scientist thing going on. But see if this sounds familiar to you at all. There's a journey at the beginning of the movie. Mm -hmm. It's shrouded in fog and mist. And then you end up in a mysterious place that's really forbidding with with really evil goings-on in a building. Dracula. It's Dracula. It's it's the plot of Dracula. Blum Reinhardt. So, I mean... This movie is a meld of Dracula and Frankenstein, and mm. and and no one like d- talks about it or watches it or whatever. And it's just it's amazing to me. But there's another thing, you know that saying like if you come at the king, you be sure to kill him, right? Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. So so what's a- another amazing thing to me is y- you would argue that Dra- Bella Lugosi's Dracula is so good that that you don't need another Dracula. Until you get like Bram Stoker's Dracula, yeah, right, and then you're like, I needed another Dracula. Maybe mm-hmm. I didn't know I did, but now I did. You, we wouldn't want to live in a horror universe where Bram Stoker's Dracula didn't exist, where Coppola didn't make that movie, right? Yeah, I wouldn't. There have been multiple versions of the Doctor Moreau story, and this fucking movie from 1932 is still king, and wow, it still yeah. holds true. But it's not like the people who came at this movie were weak. Check this out. The second version that was released in 77 stars Burt Lancaster, <laughs> mm. right? And the next version is Marlon Brando. Marlon Brando came for these people, and they still win, right? So, I mean, you have that. But on top of that, the the you have an amazing villain. You have Bella Lugosi in it. Jesus Christ. Who's making up for his mistake he made with Frankenstein, where he turned down the role because he's like, I don't want my face covered. And now oh, yeah, he's yeah, yeah. like covered in hair. <laughs> that was my favorite, that's my favorite part of horror history is I don't want that. And then like all the other films. Like, <laughs> he's, it's like, he's like Igor with like hair on his face and shit. Yeah. It's, absolutely, it's absolutely amazing, right? So that's another thing about it. But And I, I knew this would mean something to you because I know how you get in the Halloween spirit. But we had done a trivia question from a book that had been published like last year where a guy had claimed that the horror movie that had the biggest impact on rock and roll music was this movie. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. that's right? a good one. And when you track down all of the the impact it's had on it, right? So Van Halen, there's a the, so in in on the island, Charles Lawton's doing his mad experiments where he's actually cutting human beings apart and reassembling them as animals and doing mm-hmm. all kinds of crazy evil shit. 
they you you hear the screaming from that 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 building, and then the, one of the characters who's been tortured there turns to the one of the protagonists, and, and he's like, "What is this place?" And she goes, "That's the House of Pain." So Van Halen did a House of Pain song, right? So you've got Devo doing Are We Not Men, which is from this movie. Oh. You got Van Halen doing homage to this movie. And then, and I don't think a lot of people know this, there's a horror rock band called The Manimals, right? And that band, <laughs> the film historian Gary Rhodes called them the best ever horror rock genre band. Wow. And they, I mean, very few people have heard of this band, right? No. But they did. I like Blood is the Harvest is their album, and they did Island of the Souls, a cool title. right? They did. We are. Are we not men? They've done all this. All, they did Sayer of the Law, which is Bela Lugosi's character, right? So, so not only can you get in the Halloween mood by firing this movie up, seeing some mist, seeing some fog, seeing some monsters, seeing some mayhem, seeing an amazing villain because Charles Lawton's performance is just like so subtle and so dark. And but with such evil joy, like he's like yeah. an evil Santa Claus in parts. Like it's just like that part's amazing. But you can also fire up the music. Like it's you, a double right? win. It's a double win, right? You can just get the music going and kind of like listen to the thing. So because you got both of those things running simultaneously, and because really really heavy hitters came for the king mm-hmm. and didn't kill him, I'm going with this movie. Damn, <laughs> yeah, that's a good. That's, that's a good, my, right. That's a good threshold to have. That no one's been able to dismantle you. Right. I mean, so this movie's 32. So literally, the odds are that this movie's going to hit its hundred year anniversary. Oh, and by the way, it's 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 written on a very short novel, Island of Doctor Moreau by H. G. Wells, who didn't do anything for horror except for War of the World and Invisible Man. <laughs> Right. So, and what's really cool is this movie was written, the, the book was written as an, you're not going to believe this, he he did it as a fundraiser. He didn't write this book because it came to him. It, he, 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 they, they approached they him. Fundraising. They were fundraising for animal rights oh, and anti-animal wow. cruelty. So the book is anti-vivisection. So like back then they were cutting up whatever. It didn't matter. They didn't care. And it was it was considered cruel to experiment on animals. Yeah. So this is an anti-animal experiment book that turned into an amazing horror movie. And my last argument for this movie is H.G. Wells was asked what he thought of the movie. And he said, I hope it has a really positive impact, but I hate this movie. It's too much horror. I'm he sold. I'm sold. If H.G. Wells <laughs> thinks you put too much horror in your movie about his book, and now it's going to turn on his 100-year anniversary and still be the best version of that book. Has there ever been another, like, has John Carpenter ever came out? Or like no, like that, that remake was too much horror. Yeah, that was just too, <laughs> too, that too, was too scary for me. <laughs> right, exactly. So I, it still holds up to this day. Trust me, when you fire this movie up, there's... There's scenes where it's like it, it's it's as strong as the movie Freaks. Like there's yeah. scenes where you see the riot and they're like, and of course they're gonna tear Doctor Moreau apart because yeah. because you reap what you sow, yeah, yeah. right? But when you see them rising and like coming after him, like it was amazing. I'll put in the show notes. There's an amazing uh, YouTube uh, about 15 minute interview of John Landis talking with Rick Baker and Bob Burns about the background of this movie. And the makeups and the and the costuming and all that stuff is just it's only fifteen minutes. It's only fifteen minutes. Sorry, God, I wish it was like. But it's mind blowing and it's really good. So that's my first. Uh, I'm throwing my lifeline to this entire movie, just because it was in an era. It failed at the box office. It failed. It was forgotten like yeah. right away. And because this movie came was surrounded by Dracula, Frankenstein, Wolfman. That's it, hard to <laughs> punch through, right? Especially if it's considered a financial failure. Do you know what studio did it? Was like Paramount. Mm. Oh wow! For some reason, I was gonna guess like RKO. That sounds like some <laughs> right. Sounds right. like some bullshit. Right. They, 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 they would look at like we got this Kong movie. Maybe we should, <laughs> I don't know. Keep, keep with the animal theme or something like that. Right. I suppose exactly. So I'm sure Nick will edit in an amazing Manimals little music song here eventually it's I'm just gonna I'm gonna watch a party their whole <laughs> album a listen party but anyway that, what do you got next what's your next lifeline mm-hmm. my next lifeline and I know this director needs no like help of people telling him that like he inspires them because if you look on his Twitter he, he's always liking when people say like really nice things about him which mm-hmm. is great uh, but like no one really talks about this film um, because he has so many other great films before it right. and a few other ones that are starting to now it's, it's in this weird spot so I'm talking about Kevin Smith's Red State 
Guys, is, is, that, uh, is that you, Travis? We are coming, family. Good evening. Good evening, Good evening Grandpa. Grandpa. I hate wickedness in America. Rampant fornication, adultery, abortion, flagrant sexuality. Everywhere. Hey, you, you fucking bitch, let me the fuck out of here! And it's up to the righteous to curb the spread of his disease. <laughs> you might take children out now. Get grown up in here. <laughs> Send the sinner straight to hell. Send the sinner straight to hell. God doesn't love you. Let's fear. And you have everything like clerks, mall rats, chasing Amy, dogma, all that other stuff. Sure. And then he was like, I'm done filmmaking. And then it was like, Red State. Oh, he did the Bruce Willis cop film where he like hated, hated Bruce Willis' guts. <laughs> Um, and then, and then, like in in that era, was that film in Red State, and then it was Tusk, and then Yoga Hosers, and and now he's doing all the TV stuff, Supergirl, Flash, and all that stuff, which is great. But everyone, I, I noticed even in our even in our group, ah, uh, crap. Let me do. Okay, so it's in this. Uh, the period of. Yeah, it's in that weird period, and I well, what I'm noticing even with our community is that Tusk is starting to get. Like all the the recognition, which is great, it is because it has Michael Parks. Sure, it's got uh, some crazy uh, monster effects, which I'm always down for. Yep. But and Justin Long's no slouch in horror himself. No, no way. But I feel like if I had to choose between Tusk or Red State, I am gonna train like Rocky and Rocky Four to fight for Red State. I mean, <laughs> holy shit. I saw this film. So backstory how I saw this film. I mentioned it on lives a few times. I might sure. have mentioned it on, ep- on an episode before. But Kevin Smith announced that he was doing... Well, I actually didn't know he was doing a tour. So it, this film didn't have like a big release. I think he was going town to town showing it. Right. Like a traveling circus or something like that. And I was where I was going to college at a community Which, college. Which, by the way, is how I want to see all horror movies. It is fun. <laughs> Uh, so I was going to this community college, uh, taking some theater classes, and you could also work on certain places like that for a little scratch. <laughs> <laughs> right. And um, the guy, uh, I was taking a lighting class, I believe, and the guy who was teaching the lighting class also ran the joint. Right. And so he mentioned uh, that there was a show coming up, because he knew I wanted to do film. Mm-hmm. And he goes, Kevin Smith uh, is coming here. And I started freaking out. I was like, oh my God, are you kidding me? Like, Kevin Smith's going to be here? That's, that's great. And I was like, I want to sign up to work that show. He goes, well, we don't need that many students because it's literally just a screen. <laughs> like, you don't need that. <laughs> right, you don't need... Because right. the, first, the first show I worked was Romeo and Juliet, and the the stage fell on us. <laughs> but there, but a lighting bar was down, and it caught it. So it was literally like a couple hundred pounds that was going to smack all of us in the head. It was really crazy. The and, gallows. Yeah. Really <laughs> really yeah, that, that was my life. <laughs> that was my life. So uh, the the day comes, and he goes... Uh, he comes up to me, and he goes, listen... Uh, we have people working it, but the back door is open. And then he just kind of left it at that. And I was like, do I have to have sex with you to see this? Like, right, what is- <laughs> right, right. What's the catch? <laughs> what is that? What's that catch? No, but, what, but so he was basically just saying, just just come in, yep. sneak in, like you're fine. And so I, I go I go back there, we watch it, and uh, we sat in the very, very back. The whole thing was almost sold out. And this is in Springfield, Ohio, too. Mm-hmm. And it's not like, oh. You said tickets were like, 40 bucks? It was like 40 bucks, something like that. It was, it was, it cost a little more to see this. Crazy. And, and he had pretty much a whole place maxed out. There's a few rows in the back that were, that were open. And so we watched the film, and then he said, like, yeah, I'm going to be live tweeting during the film. And then I see someone on their computer to the right, and I'm like, what kind of jackass is on their computer? And it was him. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, I guess, I guess the jackass that made the film? Right, yeah. <laughs> now I feel like an idiot. Like, it wasn't just a theater. It was it was the Cuss Auditorium in Springfield, Ohio, which holds quite a few people. I guess, you know, it's where the traveling shows go and do mm-hmm. all that other shit. So seeing it on that screen was like, whoa, like, way bigger sound system, way bigger everything. It was really mm-hmm. great. And there's a scene in the film where the kid, I forget the kid's name, but he's the one in the Friday, or uh, Nightmare on Elm Street remake. Um, he he gets caught in a, he, he gets trapped by the church because... I think him and their friends, I think they're like virgins or something like that, so they pay a hooker to like all right. to all have sex with her, but then she drugs them and takes them to this church where they sacrifice them. Right. Really grim. Uh, grim. And he's in a cage, and they have a tarp 
draped over it and you're in there with him and you just hear like the wheels turning and he's freaking out and i remember in that theater in that experience like i started to like not hyperventilate but i remember i I caught myself breathing weird sure and i was like holy shit like this film it was this big theater Mm -hmm. with the director sitting over there Mm -hmm. i like like the guy who made all this shit up is sitting over there and i'm still buying the fuck out of it that's so cool like that and it blew my mind like like i know people always talk about how great like the illusion should be blown yeah. You're, you're, wa- you're looking at the Wizard of Oz. Yeah, he's sitting there live with no curtain. Yeah, like, <laughs> right. he, he's just like illuminating his face with his mag. <laughs> but I'm sitting here like believing that this kid is real fucking danger. And That's I was, awesome. And I was like, holy shit, like it is such a good film. And it's so different than, it feels different. Like I was, before we were doing this episode, I was like, how would I describe like most of his films? And I, and I, I came up with a term, I don't even know what it means. But this film, I don't know what this term means. I'm going to have to like meditate on it. But it feels like honest filmmaking. Right. I don't know what that means. Like, it just, it feels... No, it makes sense. It feels, like, it feels real. And not real in the sense of, like, the the characters. Mm-hmm. Like, it felt real as in, like, when they made this film, they meant that shit. Right. Yeah, like, like, like they believed in it 100%. This wasn't the studio needs another film. This was, like, totally. I have an idea, I believe in this idea, and we're going to do it. And it completely fucking shows during the the scene I showed you, the mm-hmm. sermon with Michael Parks. Yep. That is a nine minute scene. That is of him, like a little symphony in that movie. It's amazing. It is like I like I wish Kevin Smith just did more of this. Like I like I love everything, but like there like I I I can't think of a film that I've been so enthralled with than like that night. Those nine minutes. Right. Nothing horrible happens in those nine minutes. It's not a. It's not a. Nothing league. happens. A lot of things well, are. A lot of things are said. <laughs> but just the just the way because I was even just like sort of like re-watching it and just admiring like the editing and the pacing of his writing in right. that scene he is such like people, you know, when we talk about like great writers in the film like it's usually Aaron Sorkin like mm-hmm. he comes up first mm-hmm. but god damn like Kevin Smith needs to be on that list yep. somewhere and like that's what I'm gonna fight for is like hell yes like, like his writing is just so on point and it's that that part like watching Michael Parks do that it's amazing because it reminded me a little bit of I, I probably won't get his name right, but what John Carroll Lynch does in The Invitation or in even in Channel Zero, because he's got that same kind of creepy but sort of cheerful presence somehow, like yes. whatever you know. But they those movies you have to lean on them doing monster things after that. I don't feel like Michael Parks needs that. I feel like he can just do this. No, even what's funny is after the sermon he tells the kids like take them to the other room uh we're about to do adult things mm-hmm. or something like that mm-hmm. and I, it's like oh my god like the next scene is them shooting like a flare gun into a guy's who's crucified mouth right and it's it's just fantastic but even just watching this like even if you don't watch the film right which is just stupid because it has john goodman in it and he's fantastic and has this great shootout at the end just watch those nine minutes and tell me that is not a horrifying no it's amazing fucking scene and even this the 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 setting of the film I was watching it because, like, I, I didn't go to church growing up. Like, I right. dated a preacher's daughter once, and I went to her father's church. And, like, I remember, like, the way... Like, they were kind of a weird church. I'll sure. say, I don't give a fuck. Like, it was a weird... It was very cult-like. And it reminded right. me of this, which is right. probably why, like, I like the film so much. Mm-hmm. But even just, like, the setting of that church, I was re-watching it, and all of a sudden my brain triggered, like, that wood smell mm-hmm. of, like, an old church. Mm-hmm. And I was like, oh, my God. Like, <laughs> right? Like, I could smell where they were. It was like the theater we saw in Tokyo, the 40X. It was happening to you. You were yeah. getting sense and... Yeah, like... it, was, it was there. <laughs> and... It, what, what's so funny is the way that scene's lit like he's on his stage doing his sermon and in the background it's really dark for whatever reason mm-hmm. and I was just like for some reason that darkness on the back is freaking me the fuck out like it has it's it's, it's not it has not it's not anything important but I was just right. I was just freaking out about it but there like the other thing I thought of was that if I know everyone always says Kevin Smith should do this Kevin Smith should do mm-hmm. that and he's like I, he, our opinions don't give matter right right but if you would have told if you were to tell me that this film or the, the this this church that scene is all happening during the purge right i would be like yes it absolutely is happening <laughs> to the purge right it's the crossover like that family and the purge is the crossover i didn't know i wanted until today that's awesome <laughs> until saying it and then i thought about it i was like he's such a good director and writer like you think about the first purge and you know those films they still make money and they, they're sort of sure. a yearly thing and now they have the tv show and, or whatnot but imagine if so he took you took someone like kevin smith's dialogue and his characters mm-hmm. i think those people in a purge like setting 
mm-hmm. would make it so much more interesting. Oh my god, and I, so much more engaging, and I would care so much about these characters. I would give anything to watch the Purge break out in Clerks. <laughs> would be amazing. Yeah, <laughs> it would be so fucking great. It would be, it would be so great. And what's funny is, is the kid, the the main character, the kid. Uh, that gets captured in the cage. You don't you don't know him for very long. He's at high school and he goes to the the, sure. the hooker's house and he's there. But even just in that little bit of time with that little bit of dialogue, I still care about him right. and the way they shot him in the cage too. Like right, like, like it's so great. And uh, Ralph, uh, I think Ralph Garman, uh, who who does his uh, podcast Education, I believe has a has a a role in the film. And the kid, he's like screaming, like, let me the fuck out. And then he, Michael Parks just looks at him and he just grabs like a little cattle prod and just shocks him. And it's just like, it's a little shit like that that's just, like, they thought this through. They're like, okay, yeah. we're, we got a kid, grab the cattle prod. Right, <laughs> we right. got to do all this shit. And honestly, that's the only part I really want to, fo- like, the whole film's great. But just that church scene alone, I think, warrants this film to just. So sample the scene first. And if you don't like it, which makes you questionable taste, then, then don't watch the rest. But if you like it, Watch. Then, then you're gonna absolutely, you're Watch absolutely over. going to love the rest of the film. Excellent. Well, it must be the color portion of the program because the movie I'm fighting for last is Green Room. <laughs> Red and green. <laughs> it's Christmas time right? like, during October Halloween. Right? <laughs> uh, and the reason I'm fighting for Green Room is, first of all, the director just came out with. Hold the Dark for Netflix, so it's someone who's oh, start, yeah. starting to really influence the field, but it's also the the reason I feel like this one needs rescuing is because horror fans have mostly ignored it, from what I can tell. Yeah. Not that they didn't watch it, they just don't categorize it as horror, so I don't want to get into the category argument, whatever, but for people who want their horror to be like slashery or supernatural, or whatever, it's not gonna, it's not gonna, it's be, not gonna be what that. they're looking for. But so it's not going to be Pet Cemetery for you. But if you like your horror Cujo, then your this is your yeah. movie because it's a confined spaced horror movie confronted by a non supernatural villain or multiple villains in in like whatever case you want to talk about. And it's also one of the best movies I've seen like literally in the last ten years. So, um, but the main reason I'm putting in here is because the, there's two things because the running theme from our choices so far is amazing villains so like when you look at what we're talking about we're talking about charles lawton and in i lost souls we're talking about michael parks michael parks like these are these are amazing villains but not the conventional ones not the yeah. dra- not the draculas not the whatever but they're still amazing villains yeah, like yeah. super top-notch villains and um patrick stewart is not a lot of screen time in this but he is an amazing villain in this movie it's still crazy that he is a villain in a horror film right and he 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 wanted to do something different for his career but he fell in love with the script he's like i have to do this and he like inhabited this part you can tell when an actor is really motivated to knock it out of the park because he really knocks this out of the park so that's but the other thing is right and the other thing is because i like a little contrast so like obviously when you're heading towards halloween and we're getting into you know mid late october you're going to be looking at some of the stuff that we were already talking about with the fog and the atmosphere and the castles, and mm-hmm. you're look, you're going to be looking at the valleys and the things like that. Oh, yeah, 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 definitely. This movie is just, it's just flooded with atmosphere, but the atmosphere is super unique. Mm-hmm. So it's going to be a really good counterpoint to the other horror atmosphere that you're going to see a lot of, you know what I mean? Like James yeah. Wan, all of those movies look the same to me. You know, I mean? This mm-hmm. is a really distinct movie. It's really, really dark um, in its implications and what's happening. And one of the things I really like about the way this movie is built is that it's a series of totally believable choices. That's another reason why I want this movie in the horror category, at least at least partially, right? Yeah, or at yeah. least halfway, because that's one of the blights of the horror genre is even in some of the the really good horror movies the better horror movies the flaw is that the characters are making implausible choices yeah that's always that's always the one thing like oh why would they do that right that's the charge right and in this movie 
I feel like the choices they make are they're stupid, but they're not unbelievably stupid. They're stupid in the way that this this is how this would develop. Yeah. And one simple dumb decision will lead to another decision that would lead to your entire life changing, and then you getting exterminated, which is, <laughs> which is kind of how this goes down, right? So that, like the not a happy the, ending. No, no. Well, it's a sort of. I mean, a couple of people survive that like you're rooting for, but it's a really rough ride <laughs> to, to get there. Um, it's, it's, it, it's top to bottom, just writing, cinematography, uh, even effects, all of that. And the fact that you could take a movie that feels so small and like Hitchcockian, mm -hmm. that's just taking place in a couple of places, right? But then to me, like the selling point of this is obviously, so you've got a band through, just an accident they witness a crime and then they they get trapped in this green room and they end up having this negotiating situation where it's a little bit like panic room they're dialoguing with the people outside of the room there's a couple twists where people aren't really on the sides that you think they are which is great oh. and there's a lot more to where they're trapped than you think there is i.e. there's stuff under them that they don't know is there so that's kind of amazing right and then, and then once they get out of there, they're running around. They're trapped in a little room that's in basically a huge like club. And then you're 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 out of the room. You're to the secret place that I won't spoil. And then you're in the club. And then when finally you get out of that into the space, the atmosphere is it's like an atmosphere atomic bomb goes off. Yeah. All of a sudden you're in a woods. That is like the luscious, greenest version of a Hammer movie you've ever seen, oh, right? Yeah. And and there's there's these shots in this movie where like there's they even did it in the trailer because they knew it was like a winner where they they have a dog and the camera's following this mean looking dog that's dragging like a chain down a road and you're just following it in isolation. And it looks scary, but it also looks abused and defeated. And that's like the magic mix of this movie. Mm. Is There's all kinds of characters who are villainous and intimidating, but they're also kind of beaten down. And and not that you have any sympathy for Patrick Stewart, you don't. Yeah. But the very last thing Patrick Stewart says in this movie is incredibly self-pitying. Right, just like the dog. It, it, I'm making it sound like it's obvious, and it's not. And it's it's. It's 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 uh it's not in your face, What's he right? Say? So, but the very last thing he says is, I, I'm not gonna it'll spoil a plot point if I say what he says. But the, he says what he says, mm -hmm. and the characters that are confronting him when he says it turn to each other, and and the girl says, "Please tell me those are gonna be his last fucking stupid words." Wow, <laughs> right? So you know you're in full on villain mode, but you yeah. also know. That you're the it's the kind of villain that is is, um, is everyone is beaten down is the yeah. point right so like I I find that amazing because because when you deal like when you look at like uh, David and Goliath like a Luke Skywalker versus Darth Vader scenario mm -hmm. right Luke's always the one that looks disheveled and kind of like outmatched and yeah. smaller and Darth Vader's just perfectly intimidating mm -hmm. right. In this movie, Patrick Stewart's very intimidating, but he's also like psychologically already beaten. Everyone's beaten in this movie. Wow. I've never seen anything quite like it with that kind of style. So, for the atmosphere and for the fact that it's f a full on flowering of Cujo horror, mm. like it's impossible to like, and I think the book Cujo is superior to the movie, it's impossible to like something as well done as a Cujo in that vein. And not like this movie, I think. So, like, I just don't think horror fans... I think horror has become more and more supernatural-oriented in, yeah. in this phase, right? And it, I feel like because of that, some of these amazingly small, quiet movies are going under the radar. And maybe they're being enjoyed by thrill as thrillers, and maybe they're being enjoyed as indies, right? But they're not getting talked about enough as for the horror elements that they, that they possess. And that's... That's the thing is that I found really, really like magic about the the fact that they secretly have 
this this the way it's lined up it's almost mathematical like it, the way Shit. it plays out because people get taken out like almost it felt to me like i'd have to go back and watch it but it felt to me like yeah every 15 minutes you lost someone else wow. you know what I mean? and then you think about the fact that the whole thing is set in a music place to a band that scores things like and actually talks about stuff like that and then to watch it rhythmically happen Jesus Christ. you're like oh my god this is this this guy is playing on a different level than than most right so it's an amazing a movie but it's just so rich with atmosphere that it'll get you in the october halloween move for, mood for something dark and thoughtful and like slow burn even though there's a lot of action in it yeah but it it's the kind of atmosphere that you're it's not going to be like wow i had too much dessert when you get to october 20th and you start watching the supernatural ones yeah it's just it's just like the appetizer heading towards that like whatever even though it's a great movie on its own so I, that's my that's my that's my rescue line to uh Does patrick stewart in the film have an american accent um he just sounds like patrick stewart but he sounds like patrick stewart like monotone like really like drained out you know uh, like, yeah. he doesn't i mean i guess he probably was doing an accent i i think it was so i was so in the movie i felt like i was participating in it that i wasn't even noticing wow. like, like that kind of stuff because normally know? when you have someone like patrick stewart right you're just like that's Patrick Stewart, like right. it's great, like you, like it's weird, like you know he's such a great actor, but totally. at the same time, like. But you know the weird thing is he sort of dominated the conversation that I got when that movie first came out, and and rightfully so, like he does an amazing job, but everyone does an amazing job in this, wow. and he's not on the screen that long, and he represents something evil and reprehensible, which is like kind of like a white nationalism, right? So like yeah. he's he's representing something bigger and more villainous than he is and he actually comes out comes off at the end of it really small and petty wow. and i think he knew it i think he didn't want to overwhelm the movie himself you know what i mean he's not in it that much he just sticks the landing where he is but all the other people the entire cast is amazing and that whole secret room twist and what goes down in there is just so prime i'm telling you it's, god all right so Sounds like it's true. no question. It's, in the it's no question. I'm just, I'm not so much rescuing it for being underappreciated. I'm rescuing, I'm throwing it a line, pretending that it needs saving. So I, when they grabs the line, I drag it to the horror. Yeah, you're like, <laughs> right. like wherever you belong. Yeah, great, come over here. So, time. All right, hit me with your TV episode. Okay, so the TV episode. So this is, this is interesting. Because normally when like, when we start talking about like, Hey, let's pick a few TV episodes. I'm always like, okay, do we got a Twilight Zone episode? Do we have a Tales from the Crypt episode right. we can throw in there? Do right. we got Are You Afraid of the Dark, Goosebumps? Like, I always go for the big ones. And, but it felt a little weird. And I was like, so what's something that I could do that I feel like is underappreciated? But it's going to sound weird. I'm going with the Black Mirror episode. It doesn't sound weird. I liked how you explained it to me, which is it's underappreciated inside the Black Mirror universe. Yes, so right. within Black Mirror, whenever you talk about like the greatest episodes, mm -hmm. people talk about San Junipero, sure. uh, uh, Metal, uh, Metalhead. Metalhead, recently Cal the USS Callister. Yeah, USS Callister. Right. But I really feel like the most criminally underrated one that nobody ever talks about for whatever reason mm -hmm. for whatever reason is hang the dj yeah mm -hmm. i will fight that this is my <laughs> actually when we were talking about this i said that this is my favorite episode mm -hmm. of all time mm -hmm. nobody talks about this episode and i and i sort of get why it's not it's not a horror episode right like in the terms of Metalhead, sure, or like the uh, like the pig fucker episode, sure. You know what I mean, like yep. Which I which I get, but there is there is a horror. Um, there's a sense of horror, but not in the sense of um, of scare, scared or dread. And there's there's a sense of horror in, oh no, I fucked up, right? Uh, in this episode that I think is done super well. So it's called Hank the DJ, and the short version of it is sort of dystopian, like universe uh, sort of deal going on here you have this app or the coach uh like a Siri sort of type deal that pairs you up with someone right and you have to be with that person and both parties can agree that you have to agree um or i think you have to agree to see how much time you have left in this relationship right um Actually, I don't think they have to agree. I think you can you can look because that's a very important plot. That's what point. happens. Right? <laughs> very important plot. But it's a there. it's a romantic reframe of the classic. We can 
sequence your genes and tell you when and how you're going to die and do you want to know or not yeah right and so but it's the relationship version but yeah it's re- relationship version and uh you, you you got your two characters and they uh they, they they meet each other and they have like a really great time together they really hit it off but then they see it's only for 12 hours which is <laughs> which is <laughs> right. that's it right like it's you like you found the love of your life and you get, them for you less get 12 than hours right so it really sucks um, so then the, uh, the girl gets paired off with a guy for, I think it's like four to six months or something like that. And then the guy gets stuck with this woman who I think the Wikipedia page even has her as like a, a drag or something like that. She's just very, she's not amused by him at all. Right. He's stuck with her for a year. I thought it was a lot longer, sure. but a year in a relationship feels like <laughs> decade. with something like you end up not being with feels right. like forever. Right. Um, and so uh, they try to get back together. She goes through a bunch of other short-lived relationships and um, they end up getting back together. Like they meet each other through a set of circumstances or they just keep going at it and they eventually see each other again and they they agree not to look at how much time they have, which is smart. Like, hey, let's just let's just be with each other. That's the answer to the question. That's Don't the tell end. me what my illness is. Don't do I'm it. I'm going to live my life. And the, this is the, 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 the scene this episode really hinges on is they decide not to look at it and then I think it's the middle of the night the guy ends up looking and he sees that it's five years. Right. And he's like, oh, it's five years. Like, okay, that's great. But then the algorithm goes, but now you're not trustworthy. Three years. <laughs> and right. just and like two years <laughs> two years in a matter of two seconds is gone right is, is insane and then and then he tells her and then it, they have an argument and it dwindles down to I, I I believe it's like two hours or something like that it's very so their time they would have had together turns into a death spiral of losing the time and then uh, next next to no, next to nothing right and 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 that whole scene when you're just watching the time dwindle is that's the horror part like you know, when I think of about like favorite scenes and horror, or like like iconic scenes, I always think of for some reason I think of Texas Chainsaw Two when Leatherface comes out from the records, mm-hmm. you know, and and stuff like that. Like oh, that was really scary. But when I watched this, right, right. I was like, oh, I was, I was like hyperventilating. I was like, oh my god, right, just stop, stop, don't stop. fuck it up anymore. You're stop, losing. Stop being idiots. Right. Like like you're gonna you're gonna right. fucking ruin this. And to me, that's a lot, like, yeah, you got the pig fucker episode where you have to fuck a pig lying on TV. Like, that's that's big. But sure. there's something about, like, the idea that the love of your life. Right. <laughs> like, right. Like, like, yeah, you could fuck a bunch of pigs. Sure, sure. Right? Sure. But you only got, you got, you got, you can have as many babes pigs in the cities as you want. Right. But you got one love of your life. Right, right. There's and, the one meant to be. Yeah, and that, and to me, like, I was just like, the way, the acting in this is great. And, and I was, we were talking about the episode beforehand. And uh, I forget the name of the director, but you said you Tim mentioned Tim Van Patten, and he had done he's done amazing Sopranos episodes. And holy shit, like an experienced director with this episode was just fucking butter. Um, but it was the idea of 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 that like this like these little mistakes cost him so much time mm-hmm. and, and 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 panic because even for them to get back that second time took right. took fucking forever. Um, and but the the beautiful part about it is, uh, you you fu- they they decide you know fuck this we're gonna go against the system and they climb over the wall because everything's in this big circle type area and they, they escape and then everything gets pixelated and then they they see uh, replicas of themselves with numbers above their head and I think they're like nine nine eight or something like that right and then it cuts to the real world and it's a simulation of a dating app and it says basically nine hundred and ninety eight versions of them rebel against the system to be together and the two <laughs> it's only two of them don't right. and i was like that's the most it's so romantic and awesome and amazing and it's an up, it's an uplifting episode and it ends with them uh, playing the smiths uh hang the dj which is a great song just in general but nobody talks about this episode and i don't know if it's because it's uplifting and when people get their black mirror yep. or twilight zones they want to have this uh, they want to have that piece of shit feeling, not like yeah, but it doesn't have the dark ending. It doesn't have right. the dark ending, right. which I think I think people might be using that as saying like it's not one of the greatest episodes because it doesn't sure. have that. But I feel I feel like the the like you losing the love of your life because of one mistake, right, is a lot heavier and being forced into a relationship for a year with with the other that you can't get out of, right? Yeah, and like the, like 
that that part right there, like I felt so like because I was I remember I had one relationship that lasted almost exactly one year. So like when he when it paired up for that, no one does hit you. <laughs> yeah, when he paired up for him for the one with the woman for one year, or right. I guess in her eyes she got paired with him. <laughs> right. <laughs> to, to be fair, right. I just remember thinking I was like, Jesus Christ, that's gonna be a long, long, <laughs> long, long year. Well, there's a there's a um, interesting. French writer, novelist, philosopher named uh, Jean-Paul Sartre, and he wrote a pretty famous play called No Exit. Mm -hmm. And the idea behind this play was that hell isn't fire, brimstone, all the things that you think it is. Hell is that you have to spend, after you die, you spend eternity with the two people on earth that you hated the most in a room. Mm -hmm. Right? So there's a power to that. Like, when you're stuck with people that you're not meant to be with and you can't get out of it and you're just there... That is horror. Yeah, <laughs> like that's, that's hell. And I remember, like, I think because it, it shows from from both sides, and so she goes through a bunch of like really short relationships, and it's basically just her having sex with all these guys, but she has this emotionless right face, right, where she's just like, I'm not interested. And then, like, even the poster that I showed you for this is like, it's it's him with the girl who he's not meant to be with. She's sound asleep, fine, but he's just like up. Like sleeping, like yep. that kid, she's fucking out there, <laughs> <laughs> right? And I'm here, right, and right. it sucks. And to me, that is so much more horrifying, right? Than you know, metal head of a dog. I mean, you know, they're all scary in their own in their sure. own right. Metal head's good for what it is too. Yeah, right. and they're right. all fucking fantastic. Right. But for some reason, I think this one gets the short end of the stick, mainly because whenever people talk about the happy episodes or the better ending of, of sure. episodes of Black Mirror, it's usually San Junipero, which which I totally get. But sure. for me, this is the episode right. that I think uh, I, I, I think people, for some reason, put on the bottom half sure. of, of Black Mirror episodes, which I totally get because, you know, they're all, everyone has a different, but for me, totally. this, this one needs a little bit more punch behind it like so when so whenever people say which episodes of black mirror do you watch i never go you as i'm like no 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 no, no. <laughs> hang the dj hang the dj go for that one you're gonna feel better you're gonna feel empowered and there's something about like you know with like something like metal metalhead actually had a pretty inspiring ending at the end like it was it was kind of kind of weird but like it was they the reason they were fighting for that teddy bear for the kid was really great yes but like for this one I, I like it because I get that sense of dread and feeling like I'm trapped in something I don't want to be in, but then having that triumphant feeling of if I find someone who will who will say fuck the system with me, we will end up right. always winning. Right. And I just and I just I just I'm I'm a sucker for that kind no, of thing. No, that's awesome. That's, I'm it's, always gonna go for that. Kind and of I think I think Black Mirror gets a little latitude the way like a Twilight Zone got latitude like yeah. i think it's a fair comparison because i think that i think that you even in the happier twilight zone episodes when you're watching it for the first time that you're you know that there's still the chance as a matter of fact the odds that things are going to go wrong yeah so you're just on the edge of your seat waiting for that wrong shit to happen you know what i mean mm -hmm. so like it's got menace built into it because of what's around it Mm -hmm. Right, which is the framework of it. If 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 this episode was a two hour feature movie from a debut director that you never heard of and you were just watching it as that, it would probably would have a different impact on you because you yeah. know you're watching a Black Mirror episode. Yeah, and when they're like trapped with the people they're not supposed to be with, you you're just expecting it all to go wrong, right? So I think that gives it punch outside of his own story yeah right? which is kind of cool mm. yeah no i just i i remember the the first time when 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 i watched it for the first time and it ended i was <laughs> i was floored <laughs> like like i remember watching the first episode the pig fucker episode and right. being like wow like, i'm sold on, on black mirror yep but when i saw this episode i was like i will forever be sold on black mirrors as, as as long as every season we get one of these that's awesome like Forever, never, never. I will never stop watching Black Mirror. That's awesome. So that's my that's my TV episode. All right. Well, my rescue episode is actually is going to come from a a, a a series that's a little bit similar, not from the tech standpoint, but that there were a couple happier sprinkled in the mostly dark uh, area, which is um, Tales from the Dark Side. So this is from this is a season two episode called uh devil's advocate mm -hmm. and um there's a surprise twist ending to this that i only discovered today that <laughs> that i should have known but the to the setup to this is it's one of the quieter episodes um 
it's uh, it's a uh, Jerry Stiller, Ben Stiller's dad. Yeah, is playing um, a a really aggressive radio DJ who basically despises his audience. But lives off them. gets gets a great living, mm-hmm. you know, exploiting them. He's a celebrity, um, but he has nothing but contempt for the people who kind of call into his show. Right? Yeah, and um, he it opens with him kind of insulting them, and he's in that like classic. I mean, this is old, right? So like he's in that old school radio station setup with the buttons and the thing, and the, he's getting the calls coming in. And they're ringing like that old school ring, oh, like wow, you know? yeah, and and. Um, you can tell that this is just a really badly constructed person. Mm-hmm. He's not a not a good guy, right? Um, and the, the reason I'm going to bat for this episode so hard because it's by I'm a huge Tales from the Dark Side fan, and by like a mile, it was my favorite episode. Is it rattled the shit out of me when I first watched it, and actually to this day when I watch it because this episode was not fucking around. It's got supernatural elements. They they get bigger and bigger as it goes on, right? Mm-hmm. And it's got um, kind of like that Twilight Twilight Zone. You bring bad things on yourself, you know, yeah, feel. Yeah. So it's not like it's like completely unprecedented or breaking new ground like like that way or or what have you. It it's there's something really really eerie about how even though the episode's sort of funny in parts, it's deadly serious about its message. And it knows that its message is is really, really dark and can be really, really off-putting to most people that will see it. And it doesn't give a fuck <laughs> that that's what it is, right? And, and it's, it takes the risk of being sort of from a similar stance of where its villain is. Mm-hmm. And I think that's what I think makes it really special in terms of horror because... You get POV in horror, like where you're kind yeah. of approaching things from the from the from the villain's point of view sometimes, mm-hmm. right? But the villain isn't really you. You're not really endorsing the villain's stance. No, right? Yeah. Like 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 Hall- Halloween is not recommending you go around and kill babies. <laughs> <laughs> no. Right? Like, <laughs> most horror movies are notoriously a little bit actually conservative. They mm-hmm. want to... Order is threatened, and something's going to break through and disrupt all the order. You're, you're going to get invaded in your dreams by Freddy. You're going to get killed when you're trying to relax by Jason. Like, it, But everything's supposed to get reset back to normal by the authority figures and the people fighting yeah. for their lives. And even if they fail, right... Like they went down, they went down fighting as themselves. So mm-hmm. like, like imagine uh, take take like uh, the Ash Williams, right? Like, yeah. like Ash just becomes more Ash to mm-hmm. fight back. He gets ashier as it goes, <laughs> right? And and the movie wants him to get ashier yeah. as it goes, right? This episode, what what they're doing with Devil's Advocate is the villain is implicated in contempt for the audience. Like, and it, the episodes, the message of it is the more contempt he has for the audience, the worse he is. But mm-hmm. the more you're watching it, the more you're realizing you have contempt from him. So to, 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 to really go after the episode and be like, wow, this guy, I want this guy to get what he deserves. You have to be him. Wow. You have to think the way he does, right? Like, this guy doesn't deserve to live. He deserves to suffer. He deserves whatever, which is exactly what he feels about whoever's calling in, which, by the way, is a pretty good proxy for people who are watching it. Yeah. I.e. you. Jesus <laughs> Christ. Right? So it's really interesting how that all stuff. sort of that mothered it. it. To- totally. You know, like, and, fuck humanity. Absolutely. They and, suck. Absolutely. And, and, and it's hard to, like, get out of it, but there's a reason why it's really not anti-humanity, and I couldn't figure out why until I discovered who wrote it, so we'll get to that in a That's second. That's crazy. But there's amazing effects as it goes along. He's he, he discovers a dead body in his car in the garage. He has the fancy parking space, and he's the celebrity, like, whatever, and there's yeah. a body. He doesn't know why, and then things get weirder, and then the calls start to get weirder, right? And I'm going to spoil it now just real quickly because I'm going to do 20 seconds on the ending. But if you don't, I recommend if you haven't seen it to just stop here and then come back in mm-hmm. 22 minutes. It's short. I mean, it's, these are episodes with commercials back there. So, like, <laughs> it's fine. So, but, but essentially, 
it's him that was dead the whole time. So it's like that occurrence of the Owl Creek Bridge. Oh yeah, trade, yeah, yeah. Right? But he's he starts getting these calls, and you know when he does the calls, he's always asking people where they're calling from. Okay, I've got Jane. You're calling from where Tulsa or whatever, right? So then he's like, "Where are you calling from?" And he's starting to get calls, and she's the people. The voices are like, "I'm calling from 1951." They're not saying where they're calling from; they're saying wow. when they're calling from, and it's different, right? And I swear to God, Nick, the last five minutes of this episode is like the same kind of punch. It's like maybe a mini version of what happens at the climax of The Shining. It feels that spooky wow. and unsettling and cold, right? And and. It's really whatever, but anyway, so he, he, it turns out that he's brought this on himself and the devil is bringing him down to hell to host the show because he's got a slot open just for him, right? Uh. So he's going to be answering calls forever and he hates the people who are calling. So he's trapped with his callers in that dynamic, right? Like the phones are going off and there's the voices in his head and they're all saying like, I, I want to talk to you about my problems. I'm calling from 46. I'm calling from 18. Can you like, imagine like, <laughs> what it's like to ask the devil for a day off? <laughs> right? Hell is other people, right? Yeah. So, so it, but the performance is amazing. His transformation as he gets uglier. I'm going to show Nick you can't see this, but his final makeup appearance is pretty oh, spectacular wow. as he turns. Because he's great. subtly physically changing, and you don't know why while you're first That's watching That's Jerry it. Stiller? That's Jerry Stiller. Wow. So that, you know, it's amazing that it's headed that way. But it gave me such a chill, and it was so unsettling. It's one of the smartest episodes of TV I've ever seen. And... Unbeknownst to me, this entire time that I've been obsessed with this episode since the like for the last ten years that I've seen it and thought it was like one of the standout horror TV episodes of all time, it turns out it's written by a little known man named George A. Romero, <laughs> who contributed right, who contributed this to uh, Tales from the Dark Side, and I, you, I had no idea, and it's so Romero, and you don't notice it because you associate him with zombies. But it's so Romero. It's like comment on the human condition, but not overdone. Yeah. The 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 monster is a metaphor, but not in your face metaphor, right? And and the, the it's about storytelling and entertainment during the message, like because he never wanted to bore people. He wanted it to be, mm -hmm. you know, just good filmmaking, and 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 he built he built that into the story. So it's a Romero Tales from the Dark Side that blows standout my fucking episode. And when that thing ends and gives you, like, that Shining-esque, like, this guy's trapped like Jack's trapped in the painting, mm -hmm. right? Ending, like, whatever. Is such a good kickoff to October. Because uh. because it's that kind of, like, he, he, we're, the, we're the monsters, like, just like Rod Serling would have done. But, like, a little pulpier and with, like, a, a fun kind of 80s, early 90s, you know, twist with an amazing performance at the center of it. And it fits our whole theme about this is we really came up with, like, a rogues gallery of, like, really undeservably ignored villains with this whole list. <laughs> and what's funny about it is, so we, you know, we're, we're doing this episode um, here in, uh, right now we're in uh, Kobe, yep. uh, Japan. Yep. Uh, on, a, on a little cruise, and uh, this continues the tradition uh, that I somehow discovered that every cruise I go on, Jerry Stiller appears. <laughs> <laughs> what the hell? <laughs> you didn't know? No. The very first cruise we went on, it was a princess cruise, and so they show the love boat, because love boat took place on sure. the princess cruise. Sure, The one episode... <laughs> they had two oh, episodes. that's right! They had oh, like, my God, I remember you telling they me. They had, like, one or two episodes. One was one with Charo, right? Right, of course. Yeah, and the other one was one with Jerry Stiller, where he's just a complete horn dog. Classic. <laughs> like, the whole time. And he got that nasally voice, he's like, come here, baby, I got... I got totally classic. Kiss you. And so, I guess... I and get, I think I think that's amazing, and I think one of the things that makes this really unsettling is, I don't think Jerry Stiller is, like, the greatest actor who ever lived, right? Mm -hmm. But what he could nail... Was that really pushy confidence? Yes. Right. Like. Like. And. And. And he's like the Mount Rushmore of arrogance, right? Mm -hmm. So like, but one of the things that really creeped me about it, out about this episode is he does that in the beginning. He's full on Jerry Stiller mode, but evil version, right? Yeah. And he's and he's so confident, and he's like handling the calls. He's knocking people down. He's insulting them, and he doesn't. They don't even know it. He's like 
the the Mozart of just oh. like insult comedy, right? And at the end of it, he's just sort of lost. He, he doesn't know what line to answer. He didn't know what was happening. Just and seeing someone so self assured get so fumbly and not stripped know, of everything is is the creepiest feeling right so i think it's just an amazing kickoff to october so uh if anyone ends up watching this like gearing themselves up for october or halloween uh i'd be really interested to know if they get a similar vibe for this or any of the other stuff we talked about right? yeah that's that's fantastic now i need to watch that episode i'm actually i need to go back and i would I, you know what i bet it's on youtube i almost want to rewatch the behind the scenes of diary of the dead but I'm also totally. going to be real bummed out when I see George Romero. <laughs> <laughs> right, yeah, I know. Yeah. We missed that, man. Yeah, that's right. And ending with that episode, I need to check this episode out. That sounds... Well, check out all the things that were, were talked about. And then give us your own. Like, how do you gear yourself up? Besides the obvious ones, we'd love to know. Like, yeah, let hit us, us up on the Facebook page and tell us. And the Twitter. we got some Twitter yeah, actually yeah, going on. That's absolutely. great. Absolutely. That's great. Let us know what you're watching. And, uh, yeah, we got a lot of horror stuff we got to watch. <laughs> here. And we have a you know the, the big series that you got to keep your eyes. That's keep coming your, up very soon. We're, keep your, we're, we're really excited about launching this one. That's going to be a good one. All right. Well, until next time, stay scary. Stay spooky. Watch a bunch of horror movies and a lot more since it's it's October. It's the month. Yeah. It's the month we all Time to ramp up. That's it. All right. Bye, Bye guys. guys.